Hi, I'm Judy Friedman, Chairperson of PACE, People's Action to Clean Energy. Welcome to Solutions to an Inconvenient Truth. An Inconvenient Truth, as you know, is a film, an idea, a concept, a book, uh, papers, everything about global warming, a very, very serious problem for our planet. But there are solutions, there are things we can do, so we should not despair, but we should act. And one of the things we can do is to sign up for the green power option. It's, you do it through your utility, you sign up for Sterling Plant or Community Energy through United Illuminating or CLNP. It's the single most simple act, the most important act that anyone can do today. There are many other things we can do too. We can think about what we wear and what kind of houses we live in and create and remodel, what kind of schools we have, what, kind of, what we wear, what we eat, how, what we drive, all these things. There are solutions to the global warming problem and we need to get very busy doing them. PACE is an organization that is a statewide, is an all-volunteer organization. We support renewable energy, that's solar energy, wind energy, small hydro, uh, and we are very, very, very concerned about energy efficiency. We think that's a great idea. Conservation, and we're very, very, very opposed to nuclear power and to nuclear weapons. And we're very concerned about fossil fuels. As many of you know, we have asthma problems and cancer problems in this state. Very, very serious, bad air. But we can do something about it. And today I have a wonderful guest on the show. His name is Jonathan Craig, and he's at the Talcott Mountain Science Center in Avon. Way on top of the hill is a wonderful set of buildings, and I've been watching those buildings expand and the people in it uh, grow and change over the last 30 years, and I am very impressed with what they've done. And last summer we had a tour at the Talcott Mountain Science Center, and I was so impressed with what you've done from an energy point of view. And I wondered if you can tell us about some of the conservation technologies, first of all, that you employed to reduce your demand for heating and cooling and electricity. Mm. Oh, thank you, Judy. Uh, first of all, a lot of this was done before I got on the uh, scene because uh, Dr. Donald LaSalle was the director uh, of this program and he uh, came up with getting a passively designed building. A passive, now passively designed means what? Passive solar? Yes, uh, in order to take advantage of the sun you can act, put your building in the right orientation. Okay, let's, let's look. Here's a good example. Okay. Lots of houses <laughs> these days face the street which can be north. That's right. But simply turning the house toward the south, toward the sun, will help heat the house. Is that what you mean? That's the idea. And all the windows that you might have placed on the north side of the building, you just move to the south side. <laughs> yes. Uh, it's not any more cost. Uh -huh, it's just a matter of taking advantage of the sunny side of the house. This is the north side of this building. It's bermed in back, so there are no windows at all. Right. But the south side is open up and the east and the west to some extent. That's right. And the north windows don't gain you anything. They only lose, and glass is not a good insulator. So no. in order to take advantage of the sun, you might as well have the sun coming in the windows. Now, the other thing is you don't want the sun heating the building in the summertime. No. <laughs> so you have to build in modifications which will shade the windows during the summer when the sun angle is high and allow the sun to come in freely in the winter when the sun angle is low. Okay, that's, again, on this house we have what's called an overhang. So the high summer sun will not come in this house, but the low winter sun will heat it That's passively. Right. Is that what you That's mean? That's correct, yes. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing is the building itself has its own dynamics. Uh, the building that you're talking about is a um, thermal mass building, which means that it has a lot of uh, internal structure that absorbs the energy around it. Ah. And so during the day, it may soak up the heat of the sun in the wintertime and then re-emit it at night, or vice versa, in the summertime, it may get cool at night and then keep the cool What is the material the exactly? It's just concrete. 
Concrete. Anything that's a high density material will act as a thermal mass in a building. So that's a that's a an environmental way, a way to build a house would be. In fact, I've been in Sweden and I think a lot of their houses are made up concrete. Concrete or compacted earth mm -hmm. structures. And the insulation is on the outside. Mm -hmm. So there's still a, a, a good layer of insulation to uh, protect the building from the heating and cooling of the day. Wonderful. What else have you done uh, to lower demand oh. and Try to find solutions. Well, the, the, um, one of the systems up there is an active heating system, which uh, uses 52 panels to actually heat the building uh, through a thermal tank in the basement, which holds uh, 1,500 gallons of okay, water. Okay, now this is not solar electricity. That's this correct. This is solar thermal That's energy. That's correct. And you have panels on the roof. They have a, do they have a, a phase change or that liquid that goes um, into the... Tank. Actually, they originally uh, worked with just water, and yeah. the idea is that night they would drain back into the uh, tank, and uh, no freezing would occur uh, because they would be protected as the water drained back into the tank. In the daytime, when the panels were hot enough, the water was sent up to the roof to heat it. Uh huh. Wonderful. And that's a very lovely way using just water that's right. to heat this building. There were lots of houses mm. built in the 70s and 80s that incorporated, or some that incorporated that idea. Mm -hmm. I haven't seen that recently. Well, it's, it's probably the best system. Whenever you think of a solar system, you have to think of what's the most simple solution. The more systems you get involved in heat exchange and um, storage, uh, everything adds a level of complexity and also a point where there's loss. Mm -hmm. So you have the passive solar heat, the thermal mass storing that, you have the solar thermal technology which is hot water, hot water is space heating. Space heating and domestic hot water as well. Uh -huh. So there's a domestic hot water system which is a closed loop system using antifreeze in the system and there are four panels that provide heat for the hot water in the buildings. Wonderful. So when I turn on the faucet at Talcott Mountain, the hot water is going to be solar heated. Solar heated. Isn't That's that right. wonderful? This is a science center, and it's a very unique one. They're doing wonderful programs. You also have solar electricity. Is well, this correct? is our newest project. Uh, we're now a uh, year and a half into uh, having solar electricity on two buildings. Mm -hmm. And uh, we started with the Connecticut Clean Energy Fund, and we got 50% uh, funding to put uh, 20 kilowatts uh, of uh, solar panels on our building. Uh, we actually had the option to do 40 kilowatts, but we hadn't, weren't able to raise the matching funds to do the full 40 yet. So, and what uh, have your bills been like since you? Well, uh, it's it's hard to say. This has been an unusual winter, so um, the winter bills were lighter than normal uh, until we got into March, mm -hmm. and then uh, <laughs> the real winter set in. But uh, our summer bills have been quite a bit lighter. It's probably taking 10 to 15 percent off of our electric bill at this time. Wonderful. Which is uh, a, a significant savings. For a significant savings for a big institution. Right. You have a school there and That's right. uh, summer programs. We're operational year-round uh, holidays uh, programs for kids. Uh, mm -hmm. The idea is to make science interesting and fun. And when we have real examples on site, the kids learn better. Well, science is interesting <laughs> and fun because you just made me conduct electricity with one of your gadgets. That's right. I'm not, if I touch my fingers, I'm not... I'm not making electricity, but you had something. Well, actually, you are. Oh, I am. I uh, can't feel it. Well, you, you, every human being has an <laughs> electrical nervous system. Uh -huh. And uh, so you have a certain amount of electricity going through your body. But what we're doing here is really just uh, creating an induction of electricity through uh, a uh, capacitor on this system. And it looks like so a ping pong ball. It's a ping pong ball, but it has uh, <laughs> some complex circuitry inside it. Uh -huh. And so when we touch one end of it, and you can touch the uh -huh. other end, and then we'll cross fingers in the middle. Oops. Oh, <laughs> a little light and a buzz. <laughs> oh, that's amazing. So our <laughs> skin is actually having electrical induction. And you can do this uh, with a whole classroom of children. So I tell them to pretend they're <laughs> molecules in a wire and uh, that every molecule has to be touching in order to exchange electrons for the flow of electricity to occur. Oh, that's an excellent, so a, a excellent nice, uh, demonstration. Now, what is this? This looks like, to me, a piece, a beautiful piece of jewelry. That's what correct. in the world is this? Well, this is uh, silicon. And its purified form is silicon what is... Silicon sand? 
Well, silicon is purified from sand. Uh -huh. It is the pure element that is used for photovoltaic panels, the ones that make so electricity this, from the sun. these panels are made from this. That's correct. Uh -huh. This is the raw substance. Mm -hmm. And it goes through a process. Actually, we start with um, quartz. And quartz is silicon dioxide. That is what you're referring to as sand, because most of our sand beaches are really just this very hard mineral ground up uh, in fine particles. Wow. And it's so ground that's, up that's by water. That's the beach. That's your hardened beach. Hardened beach sand. <laughs> yep. And uh, <laughs> what you have to do is remove the oxygen. And uh, how do you get the oxygen out of the silicon well, dioxide? Well, you have to melt this. Uh -huh. And so you're working with temperatures of uh, 2300, 2800 degrees. And then you're going to uh, add a catalyst that will remove the oxygen from the substance. And then the purified silicon is formed into a crystal. And that's what you have here, the crystalline form. OK, now how do I get from this shiny lump to these panels, to the material on the panels? OK, that's, that's another process. Um, you first of all have to grow the crystal uh, either by uh, making a cylinder that is cut into wafers or by taking basically a cookie sheet and spreading the material out and having what is called a polycrystalline material and cutting it up into squares. So you have two types of um, silicon photovoltaic cells. You have polycrystalline or monocrystalline uh, solar That's cells. That's what one thing that excites me about <coughs> solar electric panels is that it's made from a very basic substance. One of the most common elements in the earth. It's not oil, which we're going to run out of, or natural right. gas, or nuclear, which is a big problem. This is that's very exciting. And you know that you can make it anywhere in the world. I mean, there's desert sands, and there are uh, deposits. Oh, I forgot the desert would be. <laughs> sure. Saudi Arabia should stop it's oil and go. When they the run sand. out of oil, they got plenty of sand. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Well, that's wonderful. And this then sliced. Go, what happens okay, next? Okay, they make a wafer out of it that is treated with uh, phosphorus and boron, which are either electronegative or positive on the surface. So they make it into what is called a semiconductor. Now you most commonly would know it from what we started using it for is computers. Mm -hmm. uh, semiconductors are in all of our cell phones, our microwaves, uh, our appliances in our house, uh, the kids' uh, things that they use for walking I mean, around and listening to music, all are using these little silicon chips. So wow. the silicon industry is selling little tiny pieces of this at a very high price. <laughs> now the solar industry comes along and wants to buy it. Oh, and problem all. Problem, right. Uh, when I can sell you a hundred little pieces for a hundred dollars, and I can sell you one big piece for solar for about two dollars, which part of the industry would you rather be in? Right, so now <laughs> what happens? How do we get? Well, uh, you have to uh, create more supply, which means more purified silicon has to be made, and there are only a few factories making it. Where are the factories located um, that make silicon? Well, uh, I believe in Switzerland they're making uh -huh. silicon, in Germany. And do um, they make it in this country also? Um, I believe there's some made in this uh -huh. country, but not as much as we uh -huh. would like to have made. And that's, that's the thing, is that the demand of the public for this industry is going to change the number of manufacturers and then the prices will come down. Well, uh, Germany is, has bought a lot of the silicon and now China is, <coughs> is that's doing true. more and more, which is amazing and that's a big, big, big place. Right. So that's going to affect the market too. I, I think you'll find that all the European countries and a number of the um, Middle Eastern countries uh, as well are looking at uh, these technologies and saying, well, we can't have oil forever. Mm -hmm. And so this is uh, certainly a, an alternative. Very exciting. Can you tell us a little about uh, Talcott Mountain and some of the programs that you're doing? Well, right now we're working uh, in energy uh, with a collaborative of 10 science centers throughout the state. And these uh, science centers are all working with us in teaching these concepts about solar energy. And we're using kits. And some of the materials in the kits include uh, little encapsulated solar cells. Hmm. And these solar cells are um, easily uh, used by children to just put them in light. And right here in the studio, we can get enough light to actually make this generate electricity. The light from the light bulbs in here, it acts like the sun. That's correct. Shines on that, 
activates electrons, and you can it will make electricity. It'll make right electricity here and now. right before our eyes. <laughs> um, I don't know if we can zoom in on this meter, but I'll let you hold that uh -huh. towards the camera. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm going to hold the solar cell. Oh, and there it is. You should Things be able to see happening. a number happening <laughs> on there. 420, 417, 419, you're creating energy. Okay, so that 419 is 419 millivolts of electricity. Wow. Uh, well, 500 millivolts is a half a volt. So when I tell the kids that they're looking at a half a volt here, they don't really think much about it until I say, okay, you're going to light up your flashlight. What do you use? And they use a one and a half volt oh. uh, D cell or double A battery or triple A battery. Huh. It depends on what they're using. And it would take three of these to be equivalent to one of those batteries. So that's what we're um, showing them in this little experiment. Now, the interesting thing is you can wire a series of them together. Uh, well, that's like, like this is wired together. Right. right. Like you have them to produce the voltage you need to run uh, appliances or whatever. So on the roof of your house, you would just wire more and more of these cells together until you got the voltages that we need in household electricity. And this is a great analog to what we're doing with uh, the uh, actual application of solar energy on the roof of the building, and the kids get to use this and run cars and motors and propellers and that sort of, that sort of thing. It's so very exciting, too, to watch it, track it with a computer and see from time to time, season to season, times of day, see what is uh, kind of correct. energy be, being made. We have a website where you can actually uh, dial up and see our solar panels working currently. Oh, so and can the public do that? That's true. Oh, uh, what is it? What, it's what, it's what tmsc.org mm -hmm. is our website and uh, tmsc.org slash gt3. GT3. Are our inverters and the inverters are the display and the com they convert the DC electricity to the AC current that we're using in the buildings. And so they have a readout that tells what each system is producing in the amount so of So I can look, go online, and I can tell exactly what's happening with energy and the sun That's at Talcott Mountain at any time. Any time, yep. yeah. <laughs> Provided um, somebody kicked the computer in the morning. You know. <laughs> yeah, well, that's very but exciting. And that, that hands-on way of learning is for the children that, to experience. That's the whole point. Um, Kids really need to have application in front of them. They need to have synthesis. They have to come up with their own ideas and apply them. And here you have simple materials that you can put together, but I don't have to tell them exactly how to put them together. They can figure it out for themselves. Sure. And that's learning. And you're investigating wind power also? That's true. Um, and we developed activities for wind power for the kids. Um, the mountain it's is... It's a mountain. It's a good wind spot. It is a pretty good wind site. <laughs> uh, we're, we're high enough, almost 1,000 feet above sea level. Uh -huh. And there aren't many sites in Connecticut that are that high. And the higher you go, the stronger the wind uh, capacity is. Uh, the clearer the air, the in less the turbulence. In the winter, the wind blows more when the sun is perhaps shining less? Is that... that Quite so possibly is true, is sure. It, it, uh, cloudy days, you, you get windy days. So mm -hmm. if the sun's not shining, the wind will be blowing, and that would be a nice complement to our uh, solar Wonderful. electricity. Wonderful. Uh, so that's a, uh, certainly a possibility. How do you feel about uh, the visual aspect? Some people say, well, solar, uh, mm. I don't want panels on my house because they look funny, or I don't want to look at a, w a windmill out and a wind turbine out in the ocean. Uh, do you have some answers to those? Well, uh, nobody likes the look of a telephone pole, I don't think. <laughs> I uh, they're one of the ugliest things I've ever seen. And I've seen them put up power lines where, you know, it's ruined vistas. Um, in the cases of running them out in the sound or somewhere offshore, uh, usually the distances are far enough away that you're not seeing something that's ugly. And I've looked at them in Europe, and they're, they're impressive to see. So. They're interesting looking. Uh, they're dynamic. And to think that they're making power without polluting the air, without uh, in impacting the environment in a real negative way. And the other thing is even the oceans, they create reefs underwater for oh. the, their installation. So Wonderful. they actually attract life where there are basically mud bottoms that are pretty barren. So it's almost like a natural reef system. Uh, and then you know. I think you have to compare the, l how this looks and a turbine looks with an oil spill. That's or a co coal top mountain ripped apart. That's true. We, or we certainly a, just a nuclear, 
accident which re renders land uninhabitable uh, all, and the air pollution that comes That's from right. these different uh, fuels. Aesthetically, I may have solar panels on my roof and they're heating my water today. I'll have plenty of hot water uh, this summer and I don't see that they look very different on the roof. I have a skylight on the roof too and they look very much like the skylight. Mm -hmm. So, well, John, you've lived in a house, a passive solar house, for a long time. That's you right. You found I, that a nice way to live? I was one of the early PACE <laughs> tour uh, houses, I remember, and uh, I've, I've loved uh, to come home and uh, have that house be so comfortable and it's so efficient. Um, it doesn't take a lot out of my wallet in terms of heating costs and energy costs. It's it passive works well solar? on the. Yes, it is. It works very well in the summertime. I'm, uh, I don't have an air conditioning system. It's wow. cool. Wow. You uh, live in Connecticut in the summer, and you're not overly hot, and you don't have air conditioning. That's right. Now, why? Well, I've never found the need for it. Where but what is your house? What is it about okay. your house well, you that lets some, that happen? You mentioned some things about this uh, model here. Our house is bermed from the back. It means ah, it, okay. It, the berming, again, is when their uh, earth comes up at the back of the house, and it, it uh, helps cool the house. That's true. The, the Earth's coolness, it shields the house from mm -hmm. cold winter winds, so in the winter right. it's nice too. It insulates the house. And insulates the house. Okay, so your house is bermed on the north side? That's correct, on the Wonderful. north side. Wonderful. And we're amongst the trees, and trees are natural air conditioners. Yes. Uh, and the air coming from around the house is all cooled naturally. So. I don't find days that are very oppressively hot. Uh, and if I'm hot, it's usually when I'm at work. <laughs> <laughs> the and house the, is cool when I get home. And the overhang, you have an overhang That's that keeps true. the summer sun well, from I, I built two layers of overhang, uh, both on the first and second floor, based on the roof and actually the structure of the house, which comes out over. The, the second floor or the first floor windows. So neither and first floor or second floor gets hot because right. of the two overhangs. That's right. Wonderful. And the angle of the sun is high enough that it doesn't shine in the windows Wonderful. at all. Wonderful. And what is your house made of? Uh, the house is of a wood frame house, mm -hmm. but um, I super insulated it. Oh. I used six inch walls. Six inch walls. So the insulation in the walls is R19. Wow. And then I added an inch of a high R foam on the inside, and that's R7. Wow. So you're, you're talking about a wall that has an R factor of 26. R factor of 26. Wow. That's a well built house. That's so smart. And insulation is great because once you do it, it, it lasts. It, it pays it for itself. The gift over the that long, keeps yeah. on giving. That's right. What about your roof? The roof um, has uh, the 10 inch rafters, so there's an. Uh, R27 plus another inch, so 34, somewhere around 34, there. Yeah. R34 yep. for the roof? Right. <gasps> That's a wonderful house. And you did that when? In 19 when? Oh, 1980? boy. It was 83. 83. You yep. are a wise man, Jonathan Craig. <laughs> uh, John, uh, Talcott Mountain is a wonderful place. Do you want to share any more with well, us about some of the programs? Can people's <coughs> children go there and That's can right. adults, are there, do you have well, programs We, we have uh, a variety of programs and uh, first of all we have an academy for kids from K through 8th grade. And the kindergarten through 8th grade program is a full program but it emphasizes science and mathematics and technology as a way of uh, enhancing learning. And the other thing is that um, we do things that are hands-on. Uh, we get the kids thinking about problems and projects and not just learning from a book. I think book, that's so uh, important, I, especially, and I, I don't mean this, but I have a son and he school wasn't his favorite thing because mm -hmm. he wasn't hands-on and it wasn't, he didn't feel it was relevant, I think. Mm -hmm. And so I think when you do this hands-on and they can see why and apl apply it? Is that's, that that's what you the mean? idea, the application of their knowledge. The other thing is that uh, what we read in a book today may be totally different tomorrow. <laughs> right. uh, the, there are many sources of information. The internet has good ones and bad ones. Uh, we, learn, we teach them how to uh, be selective about what they're learning uh, and to make sure that they test it, that they uh, question things, and that they learn from themselves what 
really is the appropriate uh, way to do something. And another program we've talked about, Pine Point School in Stonington and some of the wonderful things they're doing, the character they're trying to build. I think your school is another wonderful place where you're trying to teach children kind of not, you're not trying to teach them facts, but mm -hmm. how to learn and to learn what they need right. when it's appropriate. So that's just, just great. And we like to think learning is fun. Yeah. Uh, you know, learning is fun. Yeah. Wow, what it's a not, novel it's, idea. It's not rigor. <laughs> it, it's, it's, they, they have to uh, take tests and they have to write papers, but they write about things that they like and they take tests confidently on things that they uh, know and understand. That's just so, wonderful. Well, uh, I think one of the te uh, so, uh, wonderful things about Talga Mountain Science Center too is that the character of the teachers who are there. They're, I know some of them and they're very fine people and that translates to the kids. Uh, certainly uh, uh, lo the location isn't everything. Uh, yeah. <laughs> people make a program, uh -huh, that's for sure. That's right, it surely is. Well, you've done a great job and um, I hope that you can reach many people. I hope you have programs. Do you have programs for adults also? Uh, we have done programs for adults, and you know we did your PACE tours, and we will have uh, some over the summer. Um, we, we have our summer program for children, and uh, we have our members' nights. Mm -hmm. So if you're a member, you get to come up and see the stars or uh, oh, participate wonderful. in one of our programs So our you can go up and look through the big telescopes. That's great. I, I get yeah. upset, though, because sometimes I can't see the stars because of the air pollution, which well, is we, another we, reason we should get off fossil fuels, right? Not only do we have air pollution, we have light pollution. Uh -huh, that's right. And, and that's another thing that, in terms of energy, we have to consider. Um, yeah. Should we light a parking lot? Uh, to the sky, to the sky uh -huh. or should it be lit on the ground yeah. um, and to what degree do we need to light something um, that's uh, a very good point if we all our uh, lighting was down facing down we would have a much darker clearer sky which right. affects birds and insects and all sorts of ramifications that's of the of the light sky that's not really to mention us astronomers <laughs> very hard well, you do a great job up there, and I, I hope people take advantage of this wonderful asset in the Farmington Valley. It's just a I wonderful, wonderful appreciate thing. Appreciate you having me on. Well, thank you, and good luck with energy and saving energy and well, creating energy and <laughs> sending it into the grid. My next project is to get some LEDs uh, going so that we can have the efficiency of those lights, which will be uh, vastly superior, vastly superior yeah. to the incandescent and compact fluorescent. Well, thank you so much. It's lovely being with you. Thank you.